Welcome to the Filmed Live Musicals Podcast, a podcast about stage musicals that have been legally filmed and publicly distributed. The Filmed Live Musicals website contains information on nearly 200 musicals that have been captured live. Check it out at filmedlivemusicals.com. And now, on with the show. Welcome to the Filmed Live Musicals podcast. I'm your host, Louisa Lyons, and my guest today is David Nando Rogers, an actor-singer whose work spans musical theatre, classical texts, and the avant-garde. His new show, My Sunday Clothes, a cabaret about second chances, will play New York's The Green Room 42 on March 17 and will be available to live stream. Welcome, David. Thank you, Louisa. That was a really my- nice intro. Oh, my pleasure. So to get us started today, what made you fall in love with musical theater? Uh, Definitely The Phantom of the Opera, as directed by Hal Prince. Um, My grandparents, with whom I'm still very close, my paternal grandparents to be exact, um, they brought me to see the third national tour during its first visit to Providence, Rhode Island, when I was five in 1995. Um, It was a Thursday matinee. I sat in the second row. They were very determined to get tickets. And I have an an above average memory. I remember from the age of two onward. So I genuinely vividly remember that specific performance of Phantom of the Opera. In the second row Mm -hmm. of the orchestra? Of the orchestra. And Uh. um, back then, you know, there was no, I mean, there was a rudimentary internet, but there wasn't internet in your home per se. Uh, I didn't even have a souvenir program, but I would draw what I remembered of the show on a, on the back of placemats at restaurants all the time. It really captured me in a way that was so profound at such a young age. Um, and I also remember, because if you really think about it, at the age of five, you are still learning your native language. And I explicitly remember that most of the time I would hear gibberish as they were singing, but I understood what they were getting at emotionally because when you're so young, Mm -hmm. you're so primed to like really, really take in all of the context of how people communicate. Um, So I, that, that's also a very interesting thing to, to remember as well. And Mm -hmm. so I think it's why I got to me at a, at a primal level at the right time. The, the language, the, the words may not have meant much, but the music, it seems like, really got into yes. your heart. It really got into my heart and deep into my bones. Um, and I became a fan of other musicals, but Phantom has always been what I've stuck with. And the show came back, although it was the other tour, the, the, um, the Ral Company came, which was a physically bigger production actually uh it came a little less than three years later I was just about to turn eight um so I was a little bit more wizened if you can say you're more wizened at eight but you know you're you're a bit more of a individual by that point and um at the end of the show the guy playing the phantom Ron Bomer stepped forward and spoke to the audience he received the key to the city from the mayor um and it clarified to me that these were people um, I knew that I knew that it was live the first time, but it really should it, it, it bridged the gap uh, to see that in person, to see somebody speak as himself in that costume, mm-hmm. and that got me interested in wanting to be in a show. But I really, I really wasn't the kind of kid who did a lot of theater. Um, I, I saw more theater than did, um, but my debut on stage was uh, a little over a year later. I was nine. And I played Winthrop in The Music Man at a uh, regional theater in southern Massachusetts near where I grew up. Um, And and it came at an interesting time. My parents uh, split about a month before I started rehearsal. Um, And I was already dealing with some adversity in my childhood at the time. So I was able to identify with the character of Winthrop. so yeah, so it was the right show, right time. What led to you auditioning? And like, are your parents in the theater or what? like what led to that? Right. Was it like a direct link from like you saw um, Phantom 
and realizing, oh, these are people and like, that's something I want to do. What was the chain of events there? That was, that was a direct link. Yeah. Oh. It was the phantom thing. My, um, I'm from a blue collar community. Um, my dad's sister and her best friend run a music school in my small hometown. Mm -hmm. uh, they were, the, I grew up Catholic and they were the head of music for my parish from before I was born until I was 14. Um, so there was music in my life and I was very close to my grandmother and still am. And we read a lot together, but nobody was really in theater. Um, so my interest in it was contextually out of the blue. Um, and my mom just would scour the newspapers for opportunities for auditions. And so there was a casting call, the company, New Bedford Festival Theater, um, in 1999 was looking for kids to be in the music man and in the sound of music. Uh, I knew sound of music already, but I didn't know music man. I watched the film. Actually, no, I didn't even watch the film. I, I listened to the original cast recording. That was my only context. I went in and I sang Gary Indiana for the director and the producers. And I came in wearing sweatpants and a sweater. Like I think it was champion gray, like all these other kids were there dressed up and like, I was so green. But I also, I think I, I was, I already had some musicality because of my aunt. I really call them both my aunts, her and her best friend. Um, but uh, I already had musicality and I had a, a knack for understanding. I was always a very empathetic person. And, but I didn't even know the kid had a list because I didn't pick it up on the recording. They asked me to adjust to do that. And I literally adjusted and lisped it right away. So I think they were kind of interested in how I was able to take direction and was listening. Um, I hadn't even taken an acting class. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. And genuinely, and this isn't like to puff it up, but um, it's interesting to, because my memory is so good and I was going through acting school where I, I genuinely struggled. Um, mm -hmm. I would look back on my work in that show and was kind of amazed at how, um, good it was because I was so at the time at least unspoiled and I was and I even at that young age I was interested in reading interviews with actors about their processes and 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 I think I was always interested in what does it what does this show mean to the artist and what does it mean to the audience that was always my interest I was never into theater because I wanted to be in the spotlight and I still feel that way um I think a lot of people get into it for that reason. I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing, but I don't think that they're the same thing. And I think that they, that, that, per, that your perspective affects your why and affects how you approach the work, at least at the start. If that makes sense. Yeah. I'm very, this is very fascinated by like knowing your love for Phantom and the work that you've done, the research that you've done since, uh, mm. since coming to New York and this kind of like intellectual approach to it. Um, and I think I, I would love to know more, a bit, a bit more of the avant-garde stuff that you've done, um, because I think that all ties into that. It's like, it's, there's, um, a sense of theater being rooted in, uh, in intellect and in in knowledge of the world and how we can like tip it upside down and explore it in a in a deeper level, yeah, deeper level. Yeah, I think you know that intellectualism has sometimes gotten me into trouble. Uh, the short of that meaning, like it's either made me get it's either gotten the best of me and that I've gotten too negative, or um, or I've been so heady that I haven't allowed my heart into something. I'm not saying that's always been the case, but that's been something that's happened along, along the way. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, I do think even if you are doing something like Mamma Mia, I, th I personally think that the why should still be pretty strong and, and rooted in truth and being in service to people. Um, but yeah, I think Phantom being the first show and it, and it being so about what's happening within was that initial influence. And I became interested in how Prince, even at a young age, read his biographies in middle school um, or his memoirs or articles about him. And even now as an adult, I recently, I've read a few times his last memoir, Sense of Occasion. 
And the most important thing to him was that theater was a space to translate ideas uh, to the populace. Um, and I think really good theater is able to amalgamate sociology, psychology, anthropology, politics, all those things at once. And we're able to come at it from those different lenses and have it all happen at once. And that's kind of exciting because it means you can never assess or feel or know everything at once. Um, and avant-garde, I my schooling was not avant-garde at all. It was classical acting. Um, we did some interesting, quote unquote, weird training things like neutral mask or extreme character mask and viewpoints, um, which to this day I live by. Um, but it was after I got involved in a small company um, over the years in Rhode Island where we did avant-garde work. Um, and what I liked about it was that it was all about trying to root through, uh, actually, let me rephrase that. I think sometimes, especially in our modern era, we're, uh, I think it's actually, this is true about any era. There's There's always fables and stories about the most beautiful person in town being preferred or, um, you know, class issues, right? We're always so concerned about the outward shows and I want to dig into the inward shows. So that's what got me interested in ensemble work for a while in my 20s when I was, I was touch and go with my career in my 20s, but when I was making art, it was often very like ensemble based. I wrote like a kink ridden Dracula, uh, well, co-wrote. I was in a, a, a very wild, like drink the Kool-Aid version of Marasad. Um, yeah, those are good experiences. Yeah. So what was the journey from Rhode Island to New York? So um, I graduated high school in 2008 and did not get into any musical theater schools. Um, and I spent my first year of school at a program at the University of Rhode Island, which you did not have to audition to get into. But there were very good things about this program. And I no longer equivocate whether or not you should audition to get into a school as worth your time. But at that time, I had that kind of, that deficit mindset. Um, but I knew I wanted to go somewhere that was really going to, I was having a great time there actually, and made really great friends and did a production of Oklahoma that year. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in the ensemble. It was a great time. I danced. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to really dig in and I wanted an experience that brought me to Europe. And uh, I re-auditioned to some musical theater programs, but I, mean, uh, I don't want to get, I don't mind saying this, but uh, I don't want to get too into it. There was a lot of stuff from my childhood that I hadn't dealt with, and I still wasn't aware of that issue at the time. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, that issue led to a lot of shame and increasingly made me lose my singing voice. Not that it was damaged, but like I actually couldn't uh, access my singing voice uh, consistently because it's mm -hmm. so connected with our emotion. Mm -hmm. So I went, I went to acting school instead. Um, I went to the, the University of Minnesota Guthrie Theater and they had a semester mm -hmm. and their curriculum would include a semester in London uh, in the third year. So it had Shakespeare training and Meisner training and uh, intellectual dramaturgical training with Michal Kobialka, who was, at least was, I'm not sure where he's at these days, but uh, a preeminent, uh, researcher about medieval uh, religious practice as theater and, <laughs> and Kant and he, like he was just incredible. Um, so it was very intellectual, very text driven. Uh, and it was a full conservatory training in a liberal arts school. In mm -hmm. retrospect, I should have double majored or something, but um, <laughs> it was a lot of work, I will say. Yeah. Four years, 19 other people in my class, we did everything together um no auditioning so all your shows were like prescriptively cast to varying degrees of product productive success in that regard but 
um, I learned a lot in those four years. Wow, you must have been come so close with your classmates that four years of conservatory training is oh, a lot. Yeah, so close. Um, sometimes you can argue too close. I think it's a <laughs> lot. Ultimately, you can't want your you can't really over wish your life to be different. But in a lot of ways, I'm like, oh, I think I think maybe people are too young at that time to do something quite that heavy lifting, mm -hmm. uh, especially because it is so psychologically and emotionally tough. And I don't think acting teachers are a, a good replacement for therapists or life experience. That's something that um, National Institute of Dramatic Art is like the major, one of the major drama schools in Australia. There's only a few um, compared to the US or the UK. And the head of acting used to say, like, we, we won't accept you until you've got some life experience under your belt. And when I was, you know, in high school and fresh out of high school, I didn't understand it. I was like, no, I just, I know what I want to do. I just want to go to drama school. But now having, like, now that I have that life experience under my belt um, and having been to drama school, like, I, I now I understand what he meant because mm -hmm. it is, like, it's really expensive therapy. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think, and I don't mind saying that I think a lot of, talented people end up not having careers because they're not actually really ready to be a stable boat in a stormy sea mm -hmm. um and and it's also it, and this isn't a judgment on any of us i think we live in a time that has uh, a weird sense of urgency and youth worship and this idea that you have to know what you want at a very young age. Um, and so it's easy to get swept up in that, this idea of certainty too soon. Um, and it wasn't until I was approaching 30 that I realized I could have slowed down. And I'm sure I'm, I'm sure this is shared with, I'm sure a lot of people share that uh, realization in other careers as well. And the, the trickiness of our, the nature of our industry, and especially as a performer, how that gets tied up in, into like being known and stardom and um, the, the complications that come with that too. There's, there's a lot um, that can mess with your head and like what, like you were talking about before, like what, what is the goal? What is the why of why you're doing it? And yeah. is it, is it to be, be known or is it to do the work? And like for various reasons, like a, a combination of those things it's all valid, but, um, yeah, coming back to the why and the, what, what underlies that why and have you done the work to understand it truly? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And I think the other thing that gets internalized and I, and I'm truly much more at peace, but like old habits die hard or, you know, insecurities still bubble up and there's an internalization of, like, oh, I've passed my expiration date of being able to get my foot in the door. Um, which it's, you know, I think we're really dealing with a lot of tensions in society where we so, we so, there's this movement of wanting to embrace lifelong learning. Um, but that's not always practiced in hiring spaces. And I'm not just talking about theater. That's not always practiced in how we cultivate relationships. Um, and I think that's been one of my major, not, not I don't mean it's an anxiety way, but it's been one of my preoccupations with any mm -hmm. kind of art I've been making or been interested in watching is this idea of lifelong learning and growth. I mean, think about the story of the Scarlet Letter. Like the whole point of that story is, aside from like any other context of the specific plot, it's about holding moments in people's lives against them forever and leaving no space for there to be any kind of shift or change in how they're perceived. They miss it the same way. I always find it interesting how, um, you know, Les, Les Mis is, is like Jean Valjean's journey. It's about acknowledging that we leave so little space for redemption and mercy, both interpersonally and on a political level. Mm. That's what a beautiful thing to think about that, like how, again, going back to this like intellectual idea, like digging, digging deeper into um, like 
Phantom and Les Mis can now, like, especially 30 years after, like, can be dismissed as like mega musicals and they're, mm. they're spectacle for the, the masses kind of thing. But they're, this, the, the deeper story that they're telling is why they're so popular because they, they speak to people on a deeper level. Yeah. And I, I'm actually glad this is sort of like naturally coming up is that I think that we live something I've noticed and we're not the only society where this has happened and the cadence of cyclicalness of the world is there's sort of this like blase passe feeling about myth right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, people still enjoy certain myths, but there's sort of this feeling of like, oh, we know it all. This is repetitive. I've even read recent reviews about books that dismiss somebody's work as like, why, why is this person engaging with the same idea? And what's, I'm very influenced by Joseph Campbell, who did a ton of research about myth and even argues that it exists in our DNA. Um, but I'm not going to get too into that because I'm not researched enough on, on that, uh, that, that claim. But, um, but he's onto something, he's observing something. Um, I think we, let me put it this way, theater is inherently repetitive. Um, the eight times a week thing, yes, that is repetitive. But also the topics in theater or any kind of literature are repetitive. We see, in the sa we see across cultures and time, the same ruminations, which indicates to me that we as people on an individual and cultural and societal level, continuously trip and fall making the same mistakes or having the same joys, which means that we, I think it's fair to say we have not mastered being human, uh, which means how can I, I actually got really surprised when I went to acting school and disheartened at how people speak in the workspace at how bored they are so quickly by the work. That really surprised me because already by the age of 18, I'd seen Phantom by that point nine times. I'd seen other shows several times. And I mean, sometimes I go, I would go to Phantom and I would be bored, frankly, because there were people on stage who were uh, checking out and other times people were not. And I asked myself a question at a young age. I'm like, why is it that I can see this actor multiple times and they seem so alive and spontaneous and that actor isn't, which made me realize, oh, it, it is actually up to you to have the humility to realize that you might be able to endeavor to master the technique of doing the show, but you're never gonna fully figure everything out because I doubt you've totally figured yourself out. Mm -hmm. The mystery to me of a character is frankly forever. Um, you know, I've seen, I saw, I ended up seeing Phantom of the Opera live 63 times. Post pandemic, I went to the reopening night and I, and I went to the last two performances. I saw the show uh, 31 times in the year and a half that it was reopened. Um, and I would have internal revelations while watching the performances that would bl just blow my mind, either about the subject matter or noticing things in myself that I was seeing on stage. It, 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 I mean, it runs really deep. I could probably mm -hmm. write a thesis about that. Um, yeah. And I, and I think all of us have that capability. Sometimes people, people have teased me about this. Um, but most people have something that they geek out about and they make meaning through. Yeah. And so I think we all have that capacity. And I think, oh, I, that makes me very emotional what you just said. Like, it's it's very touching to that you, like, A, the love that you have for it is, is so beautiful. But also, it's one of my favorite things about being an usher. And that's where we met, was working front of house. Mm -hmm. But it's being able to watch a show over and over again. And often, you know, non-theater people or people who who don't do what we do will say, don't you get bored? How can you do the same thing? And it's, there is something so beautiful about being able to watch something over and over and over again and experience it because every day that you come to it you are different there is something different about like I you know as an usher there are different performers the audience is different every night but there is you you just just through that repetition you discover new things and it's it's like the art of practice like you mm -hmm. do the same thing over and over again but you 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 make new discoveries you find new um you uncover new magic 
in it. I, and, yeah, sorry. I just completely agree with you about that. And um, uh, it's, I end up finding that it ends up being a space of accountability. And I, and I also find that sometimes it's a safer way to touch on things that we're having a hard time thinking about by doing it through the conduit of the show. Now there's always a the danger that you're relying too much on it and not dealing with things, but everything's a balance in life. You know, yeah. um, there's always give and take with everything. Um, yeah. And I would say, yeah, I learned, I learned a lot about being an actor by ushering the previous cabaret revival in 2014 for the entire year. And then subsequently when I moved back to New York, I realized like we've gotten off the plot from the initial question, which was after I went to school, um, I felt really lost actually. So yeah, we're gonna jump back to that, which was, I went to school and I felt very lost because even in school, I was very inconsistent with how well I was able to execute what I was learning. Like there would be some projects where I was excellent. I actually had a teacher say this to me in my senior year. She goes, sometimes you are so good. And then other times you're on projects and you're so bad that I don't know what to do with you. Um, but she said it, her tone was not cruel. It was very uh, direct. And and back then we really didn't have the same language around mental health support that we do now. Actually I was talking about this with the person who now runs my theater program recently. And uh but I, what I really needed was to, uh, I really, I needed therapy and I needed healing from some stuff because um, my instrument was out of tune. Um, but it took me a long time to actually get those resources. It was not until the pandemic, actually. Um, so my 20s were touch and go. I initially, I moved here uh, about seven months after leaving school, but I bombed some auditions very quickly because I was so... Uh, emotionally deregulated um so I ushered and I interned with the producer I thought I would just become maybe like a company manager or something but after my year there the thing that I was observing I had so much fun but you know I was 25 when that revival of cabaret was closing and I realized like I wasn't happy at, on the day-to-day -day. and I was seeing people who were the age I am now who were working different types of jobs that they were just always negative and very unhappy with where their lives were. And I, something in me, even though I was in such a tough, overly sensitive space, knew that in my heart of hearts, I needed to find myself somewhere else if I was ever gonna survive here. Um, actually, there's a quote from a book called The Peace Within You that my grandmother gave me that I wanted to have near me to bring up just in case. Um, and I read it, she gave this to me when I was going to college. Um, and the quote is, beyond your challenges, beyond your successes, beyond the events with which life has molded your spirit, there is a placeless place within you. It is a place of peace, it is a place of freedom, it is a place where the self you have been residing resides. You have been seek the the. It is the place where the self you have been seeking resides. Um. And as I've gotten older, I've read some mm. some Buddhist texts, and that's you know related to Buddhism, like realizing that we take things on and deflect. Um. So things like that, like curiosity. I think my curiosity gave me kernels of hope, of things to endeavor toward. Um to eventually get better in the dark tunnel. Um, so I ended up moving back to my home, long, long story short, I ended up in Rhode Island for my mid to late twenties. And I worked a desk job, did fringe theater in an attic, um, grew and learned a lot about myself, but was still unhappy. And I was, when I was 28 in 2018, I said, you know, I'll be 30 in two years why not give it another try? So I saved up money for a year um, and then moved here with two suitcases when I was 29. Um, got back into ushering because I still had contacts in that world. Uh, I worked at Trader Joe's and I was here for you know, June 2019 until March 2020. I was doing the audition thing. Um, 
and in retrospect, like still had so much more to do to grow, but I was like a little bit, a lot braver. Um, and I, I did get cast in a non-equity contract, but that show ended up never happening because of COVID, but I'd been offered something like several weeks before the pandemic happened. Mm. Um, but the pandemic, uh, I call lockdown, I, I like to define lockdown era specifically, because that's a very specific chapter of it. And so during lockdown era, which I mostly consider to be from March, 2020 until uh, mid to late 2021, um, was like, I, I was fortunate to be in a position where I was on furlough from my ushering job. So I didn't have to actively look for work. So I, I used that time though, to finally have the pause that I think I actually probably are always needed to deal with things. I used the actors fund, now the entertainment community fund, uh, I, their social worker resources, their mental health resources. Um, they connected me with my psychotherapist. Um, I spent a lot of time rereading and reading new materials about being present in life. I biked everywhere all the time in the city. Uh, I continued this practice, but I, I started like leaving my phone at home and just starting to like actually be in the now mm -hmm. um and it helped me emerge and be more patient and give myself more credit and more grace and that practice has i mean will be three years later since that lockdown era this year and um i'm still learning and growing and finding more perspective and non-duality about things within me and outside of me than I had before the pandemic. It, I think it comes back to the idea of practice, like that we we do the same thing over and over again, but by doing like by doing the bike rides, by doing the work, by going with it, going within, being still, that um, we find we have new discoveries as we continue to do the practice. Like that's that's the point of it. It's like an ongoing. We don't. There is like for me, there is like no enlightenment. It's like you've. What's that quote? Before enlightenment, doing dishes. After enlightenment, doing dishes. It's like that. Yeah, because they just keep doing the thing. <laughs> doing the thing, and the thing, the thing ends up being a filter. Like it's like it's like this um. This default filter, this barometer, if you will that you're able to come at and the more you listen to yourself and see what's consistent and what's inconsistent, you start seeing the patterns, you start figuring out what you want, what you don't want. It's very revealing. And I, and I think it's why I actually, I'm very, I'm very sad that so many of us spend our commutes watching movies and listening to things. Um, we're really, we're, we're really not spending time listening to ourselves. Um, we're spending a lot of time in taking other noise and other opinions and other influences. Not that you can be totally devoid of those things, but we're spending so much more time not being bored and letting our intuition come up. And it's easy, intuition and fear actually get confused for each other very often because physiologically, uh, they come up very similarly. So it takes a lot of time and practice to start knowing the difference. Mm. Oh, I love that. I have so many questions. Oh my goodness. I don't even know where to start, but I think we should talk about your cabaret because we, we, that's like, we got to talk about your cabaret, which, um, the title comes from one of my favorite show songs and shows of all time. Mm. Um, my Sunday clothes. Um, it is a tip of the hat to hello, Dolly. It is. Although it's funny. Cause like hello, Do and I don't mean this in a shady way. Cause I loved the last revival. Uh, I saw it with Bernadette Peters on my 28th birthday. Um, but it is a tip, but Hello Dolly is not like one of the more important shows in my life in terms of the imprint. Um, but seeing the show that day was a huge influence. And mm. that song at that moment really moved me and probably was one of the things that propelled me to make the decision to move back a year later. Oh, I love that. Yeah, so it's, it's a tip, it's a metaphor. Um, 
it's more metaphoric, I think. I mean, put it what what you put on does make a difference. I do believe that, but this actually goes back to the idea of like what we're taking in uh, media wise. Uh, we are what we eat, both literally and figuratively. Um, and so that intentionality of like, what am I putting on? What am I putting in? What am I hearing? What am I thinking? That's, that's kind of, that's what I was, uh, aiming for with the, with the title. Mm -hmm. So it could kind of amalgamate all those things and speak to the journey of tuning the instrument as the actor, because what I struggled with as an actor was I really struggled to go after what go after things on stage and to listen because I was so um, hyper vigilant and afraid all the time. And there was so much noise in my head that I, I didn't know how to actually engage with that on stage. So if you can't do that in life, you're not going to be able to do that on stage. Yeah. Um, you are working with the musical director, Kyle Branzel. Yes. And what, how, how much has he been a part of the writing process or have you written the show and then met with him? Tell, tell me about the writing process. Oh, sure. The show. Yeah. You sort of, and this is at his encouragement because I initially talked to him about the idea about a year later, excuse me, about a year ago. Um, but you just have to set a date and then work from there because I think <laughs> with any kind of art, you, you can run into the inertia of never being ready. You know, so you just have to set the date and work from there. Uh, what made me know I was ready actually was I saw the movie Maestro in November and toward the end of the film, he's quoting his wife who at that point has passed away and talks about, you still have a song in your heart. Mm -hmm. And um, in the film, Leonard Bernstein is uh, represented as overly preoccupied and insecure. And I'm like, you know, someone who's accomplishing all this stuff is dealing with those neuroses. So if he's doing that, like, why am I allowing myself to get caught up in that as well? Uh, so the next day I made the decision to finally do it. So I think it was more like my spirit was ready and I knew what the topic had to be. Um, and then I mulled over ideas for the set list for a couple months. And then he and I didn't meet to kind of rough draft through that set list until late January, just to see like what actually felt true in my spirit or not. Mm -hmm. um, we did that for a couple of hours. And then um, I spent all of February practicing them pretty much, I'd say like three days on, one day off sort of thing. Uh, and then I, I'll often like practice talking points that go with, a, there's like an internal journey, but it might not always be explicit because I'm not going to overshare everything about my life in the, in the cabaret because sometimes the songs will speak to themselves, but also I think it's important to rub fiction and nonfiction together and to have mystery because it allows the audience to collaborate with you more uh, rather than trying to do everything mm -hmm. um so he and i just started rehearsal again about a week ago so we're meeting approximately every other day refining the choices um and when we refine those choices we talk about the song and the why and that helps inform working on the talking points and actually later this afternoon i'm gonna create a pretty a close to final draft of it because tomorrow he and I are going to run through everything for the first time without stopping and that's a good amount of time because we'll be a week away yeah yeah that's very exciting and yeah. I without wanting to give away the set list but you've got sort of classic songs like classic um show tunes and um uh some other pieces in there do you want to talk a little bit about any of the song choices yeah uh I think, you know, they all had to, there were a couple of rules. Like what I've learned about a cabaret is that you need to have a few rules, like what is your topic and do they roll into that topic? Um, and so my topic was second chances at life. And that looks different because of different parts of that journey. Um, it was also important to me that all the songs were directly linked to art that inspired me along the way. Uh, so mm -hmm. Phantom is in there, of course, because it was such a big impact, but there's even, there's two Sondheim songs that are not shows I ever, ever even saw, but the songs themselves have touched me. Um, 
in the past in my life. Um, so all the songs fit several lenses at once. Uh, Music of the Night is going to be not the first song, not the last, somewhere in the middle. And I am singing it in German. And I'm doing that for several reasons. Um, one of them is I've always loved German language musical theater since middle school, um, which sh short sidebar I think is related to my interest in what's happening underneath, like engaging with a show in a different language. Mm -hmm. um, Do you speak German? Not fluently, but I, I, I'm able to navigate it well enough, especially in a theatrical context that I can overall understand the poetry and engage with it and know the difference, if that makes sense. Um, and I That's studied so there cool. briefly. Okay. Um, and I coached with uh, an old friend who's from Germany on the dialect work for Music of the Night for the show. Um, but I'm doing it because Phantom to me, actually out of context, people get distracted by the hour shows and thinking it's just schmaltzy because they know it so well. So I'm doing it in German to highlight and get folks to just listen to it differently and to just think about what my internal life journey is as I'm doing the song, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so it's like at least two things that I'm contending with there. Um, I'm throwing in a Celine Dion song um, in a very acoustic yeah. way. <laughs> um, she, but she to me has, I've always connected with her on the radio, I mean, my, you know, my parents were young when they had me and they were 80s teenagers and someone like her was always on the radio, especially. And she, to me, is somebody who is, who really believes that what she does is in service to people. Um, so I really connect with her in that way. And I think pop music has always scared me because it's a, you know, I think about like in the movie Forrest Gump, when they represent people being afraid of Elvis moving his hips and how when we move the body unlocks things and pop music in a lot of ways is that. And so I have mm -hmm. old hangups that I've been working on uh, to get over to sing pop music. And I just felt like the right thing to do. Oh, I uh, love that. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, and then there's a song that I'm going to sing with my special guest uh, that means a lot to us. So. Yes, and I, I love that you have Alexandra Silva as your special guest, and she is also a phenomenal performer and writer. Um, her, the After, after Anna Tavka is an extraordinary book. Um, mm. How how did you come to work with Alexandra, and what's her part in the show? Yeah, so um, she and I didn't meet in real life until I was 21, when I was still a student at the Guthrie, I saw her on Broadway in Masterclass, but she knew who I was because she started her career in London in uh, The Woman in White. She replaced Jill Pace. And I was already a fan of that show because of the original London cast recording. And that was the dawn of like people sharing audio bootlegs. And uh, so another fan sent me their like opening night-ish of the new cast audio. And... They made changes to the show and she was, it was one of those times where I was like, wow, I really hear a very different interpretation that's equally as, like Jill was incredible too, but just like, wow, this is such a different sound, a different uh, point of view. And she had a blog and I missed the, the era of blogs because I had to make an intention of arriving to the blog to read it, which mm -hmm. is very different than like the, the doom scroll. The feed, yeah. Yeah, the feed. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, long form writing is so different. Uh, and yeah, I was just always so connected to how she thought about things. And then over the years, we just uh, naturally evolved into uh, knowing each other in real life and doing this. We're going to do a song from uh, that show that I discovered her through. So it's going to have, oh. yeah, it's going to have like um, a lot of meaning there. I think there'll be some thematic meaning with the overall story, but that itself is such a, exciting meta moment mm. and means a lot to me oh that's really beautiful yeah and that's almost that's 19 years ago uh wow. when i when i became a fan from afar across the pond mm. how amazing to be able to have connected and then have it turned into a real life friendship yeah yeah it's really cool it's yeah. really cool yeah so it's, it's gonna be a meaningful evening it's gonna be really meaningful 
Yeah. And I'm, I'm so thrilled that you're live streaming at the Green Room 42 is a wonderful venue. Their live streams are excellent. Um, they, they do five or six a week. That's and so great. Yeah. They're, they're, it's an amazing venue. Um, so I'm really thrilled that you're making that available and we'll have links to all of that in the show notes. I wanted to quickly touch on your love of um, Phantom and, um, and Les Mis also. They both are... Uh, shows that have been filmed live in different mm. incarnations and I'm curious what your relationship is to those uh like right. the pro shots and um how, how like how that has informed your re-watching in real life yeah. and both watching the pro shots yeah um I think I mean I was at the Royal Albert Hall event <laughs> for Phantom of the Opera I was there the 25th anniversary yes. yeah I was there. Of course you um, were. <laughs> Where else would was, you be? <laughs> it's funny how things worked out because it just so happened that um, that was a semester that I was studying abroad in London with my program. Oh, like, that is meant to be. It was so meant to be. Yeah. Um, so to me, I would say that video actually doesn't, that one specifically doesn't influence me a lot because my relationship to the live show is so specific and I kind of appreciate that as its own thing. With Les Mis, the 10th anniversary quote unquote dream cast at the Royal Albert Hall, um, that had a major influence on me, I would say, because I mean, first of all, I think I, I miss the more, the frankly, more of the stillness that was engaged with in the way that was filmed. The staging is very similar with like the subsequent concerts, but there's a lot more like going on and lights and and I felt like there's a real earthiness to that um PBS broadcast of Les Mis and it taught me a lot about interpretation of song because uh I mean that cast was so text driven I'm especially influenced to this day by the way Philip Quast and Ruthie Henshaw perform in that concert um I actually you know talking about this makes me want to just like sit down and watch that concert again um I watched that a lot I found I, I, you know, I, and I think most people feel this way. I don't think live streams or a film performance replace uh, people's desire to still go see something live. Um, the German language musical Elisabeth filmed its final uh, cast for the 10th anniversary remount in Vienna. Uh, and it made me even more of a fan. And then when they remounted the show again, 10 years later, I saw it four times in October, 2013, you know, so because that whole thing of like, I wanna go to the ritual and experience the ritual in the now is still going to be relevant. I find that it ends up being a really good, at the very least resource for knowing what's happening elsewhere. You know? The ritual. The ritual. I'm stealing that. I love it. Oh, I, yes, ritual. please do. Please do. I wanna spread, yes. spread the good news about the word ritual in theater. Yes, because and it's again that idea of repetition and like something sacred and special and oh, you are speaking my language. Um, I see that we're running short on time here, but I so I want to get to my final segment called my favorite things, where I ask you my favorite questions. Oh, great! Oh, I love and that. These are a few of my favorite things to start us off with. What is your favorite musical? <sighs> Uh, the Phantom of the Opera, as directed by Hal Prince. <laughs> I should have um, known. <laughs> but it's a hard, but you know, but actually though, it's not really a one answer question because I think there's, I have, because at the same time, I also think like My Fair Lady is my other favorite musical and Fiddle on the Roof. Like I just think different things fit different boxes. It's so easy, I think, for musicals to all get categorized as one thing. And really there's different genres of musicals, if that makes sense. It's for me, what time of day is it? Where am I? <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> uh, do you have a favorite filmed live musical? Elizabeth, as mm -hmm. filmed in late October 2005, about a month before they closed. It's really, it's an incredible DVD of the show. It's spectacular. It's been on my list for so long. I need to watch it. I, it's one that I have not yet watched. Um, a film live musical is not quite a stage show and it's not a movie. So what should we call it? Uh, a filmed live stage show. Perfect. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Where do you stand on bootlegs? Oh, um, I think ultimately they are an important... Uh, I think when they're done well and... Uh, quietly 
and not in a distracting way, I think they actually steward better record keeping of our history. Mm -hmm. um, I think people who just pull out their iPhones and how are, you know, not people who are just being reactive are not, I don't approve of that at all. Yeah. There's, I, you mentioned earlier about like the early sharing of, of um, audio bootlegs yeah. uh, on the internet. And I think there's a whole, there's a whole other podcast right there. Oh, I'm sure. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. That's even, I think it's even more ubiquitous. Yeah. I think it's easier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what stage musicals do you wish had been filmed? Um, I wish that, and I, I, please know that when I say this, I still respect the 25th anniversary of Fantasy Opera, but I, I would have preferred that they have commercially filmed the original production in London or New York before they closed. Yeah, a phantom. I, I'm still in shock that they didn't film the closing night. Yeah, there were like some archive video, videographers there. So I'm glad like it's been captured in some way. Yeah, um, but the but fact yeah. that it wasn't live streamed or like, I, it's baffling to me. Some way, yeah. A show how... of that size and scope and the history of it and it's it's uh, impact, like it's it's baffling to it's me. Its impact is very deep. Yeah, like yeah. it's not just my fandom, like its impact on culture is super deep and that's like a whole another conversation. But you can watch the original cast at the New York Public Library. They Which the... I did. The Theater and Film and Tape Archive has has the original cast. Yes, I watched it in October. And I discovered more new things. Uh, look at that. After how many total viewings are we at now? I mean, if we don't count bootlegs, right? Like, I, I genuinely think that I am 10,000 hours practiced on the topic of that show. Yeah. Like, I, I actually think it would be it would be possible for me to, like, do that show with minimal rehearsal. Um, I could, I would argue that I could probably put up a remount of the show with a little bit of like coaching about how to communicate to all the departments, but yeah. <laughs> it's, I, I feel like you're going to do it one day. That's, I hope so. <laughs> we just announced it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what stage musicals would you like to see filmed in the future? Mm. I would like wicked to be filmed um and i would like oh, i think i would like any of them to be filmed i feel like if a show has a pretty good appeal for several years i feel like it should at least film itself for a commercial release eventually that's kind of how i feel about that hmm. yeah I, I, that's a, I like that answer. So unsurprisingly, very thoughtful answer. Thank you. <laughs> Finally, where can we find you online? Um, you can find me on my website, davidnandorogers.com, um, and Instagram, davidnandorogers. I'm touch and go with how much I'll use it. I'm using Instagram more right now to promote the show, but I genuinely, I genuinely believe in being private about uh, the day-to-day -day of my life because it's in the privacy that we expand. Oh. Yeah. You speak to my heart. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. I'm yeah. so glad. This was so much fun. Break a leg for your cabaret next week. I cannot wait to watch. I know that it is going to be something very special and very beautiful and very thoughtful because that is who you are. And so of course your cabaret is gonna be a reflection of that. So we will have links in the show notes for where you can buy tickets. I hope that you will also tune in. Thank you so much. This was a pleasure. My pleasure. The Filmed Live Musicals podcast is created and edited by your host, Louisa Lyons. FilmedLiveMusicals.com features information on nearly 200 film stage musicals from around the world and dating back to 1938, a weekly newsletter with upcoming streams, and this very podcast. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, and make sure to sign up for the weekly newsletter to have upcoming streams delivered straight to your inbox. Film Live Musicals is financially supported by Josh Brandon, Geraldine Brewer, Belinda Broido, Andy Capone, Elliot Charles, 
Rachel Esteban, Mercedes Esteban Lyons, Hannah Graneman, James T. Lane, Jim McCarthy, Alison Matthews, Al Monaco, David Negrin, Jesse Rubinowitz and Brenda Goodman, David and Catherine Rubinowitz, Joe Tillotson, and Beck Twist. If you would also like to support the preservation of the history of film stage musicals and the creation of one easy place to find them all, you can now make a tax-deductible donation to filmed live musicals via the field. Visit filmedlivemusicals.com to learn more. I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.